Okay, we are live. Hello, this is Dr. Garrett Smith, the nutrition detective of the do-it-yourself original and best vitamin A detox program at nutritiondetective.work and my individualized work with people and hair and blood testing and consultation at nutritionrestored.com. Today, I wanted to go over a testimonial from someone who is doing just the DIY, the do-it-yourself vitamin A detox program and their testimonial after one year of being on the program and doing their version of it. Some people have tried to say what I do is a protocol and it's absolutely not a protocol. Some people want a simple, just you follow this recipe, you put in these ingredients and you, you bake it and you get this result. That is not how this works. People are very, very, people are sick from the same things, but they also have very, very different ways that they get sick due to genetics, due to their own toxicity exposures, due to their own nutrient deficiencies. And so we have very, very different presentations from the same general problems. And this is one thing that people don't always understand about the whole genetic component and the nutrition and the toxicity status. So anyway, this person was not working with me. And they wrote this testimonial. I thought it was great. They, they inject a lot of their own thoughts and um, ideas in here. And I'm okay with that. that had, I figure stuff out by hearing stuff like this and then integrating it into what I already know. And then we come up with new ideas and new approaches. But anyway, what I wanted to say is this person, when you read what he's doing, he is not doing my protocol. He is following the principles in the program. Principles, not protocol. Anybody who tries to give you a protocol and say that this is the way that everybody gets fixed. No. Everybody, just like every car is, you know, a different make and model and it has different things wrong with it. You have to, the, the person when I work with people, even on an individual basis, or people doing the program, this guy, this gentleman's going to talk about his mistakes that he made, which I warn people about a lot in the program. Don't do this. Don't go too crazy on this, or you're you're going to have a problem if you push too hard. Most people do it. It's a normal human thing, and uh, and then they end up realizing why I said not to do that. <laughs> so anyway, we'll go over his his improvements, his mistakes some of his ideas. I'm just going to read the testimonial as it is. I'm not going to interject. Here we go. One year on the vitamin A detox protocol. My progress, diet, mistakes, and thoughts. I'm going to change protocol to program. I'm going to interject that because some people still call it protocol and it's not. Having been on the program one year this week, I think this would be a good opportunity to share my experience and contribute any intel I can to the beta stage of this historic experiment we're all a part of. Brief history of symptoms. Since childhood, debilitating cognitive impairments. My most bothersome symptom included symptoms included brain fog, trouble processing information, interrupted speech, difficulties concentrating, short and long-term memory issues. Severe anxiety, mood instability, gastrointestinal issues, 1 b.m. every other day, fatigue, inertia, jaundiced eyes, lower back aches, stiffness, intolerance to cold, and perennially cold hands and feet. Progress. Remarkable thus far. My cognitive issues have improved significantly from processing speed, concentration, to working memory and recall. There's more progress to be made, but so far this has been tremendous. I've also been in better spirits, far less irritable, much more positive, more social, more talkative, more energy, more productive, more cowbell. <laughs> Anxiety plummeted. It still affects me, but I can now state my name and occupation as we go around a group circle without the dread of impending doom. In the winter, my hands would get frosted over with dry skin. Now my left hand is, dare I say it, silky smooth, and my right, ash, my right is ashy with taut skin. This is an improvement. I tolerate the cold just fine now. I would get sick about twice a year, every year. This year, nothing. That's a first. My digestion has improved to one bowel movement a day. 
and those hellish lower back aches have become rare occurrences. Having that said, I am unfortunately far from healed, although I revel in these gains regularly. Can this be real? Pinch me. Diet, very restrictive. Plant foods are all organic and the meat is super lean and when possible comes from animals that have been grass fed and pastured. Here's a list. Meats, bison, elk, beef, chicken, turkey, rarely. I make roasts, tri-tip, sirloin, eye of round, top round, beans, navy, adzuki, pinto, black, potatoes, boiled, white corn tortillas, homemade, a recent addition. Sourdough pretzel rolls, refined wheat, not whole grain. More on this later. Rolled oats occasionally, soaked in water, not boiled. Nuts occasionally, Brazil, almonds, macadamia, pine. Sweeteners, maple syrup, sugar. Liver, just kidding, not funny. It's kind of funny. <laughs> That's it. Meals. I eat three times a day. Each meal is pretty much the same. Meat, potatoes, beans. Sometimes I won't add as many potatoes and add in tortillas. Sometimes I'll add in the bread. I have a day of no meat every two to three days. Reasoning from first principles, we didn't evolve bodies that consume meat every day, presumably because it wasn't caught every time it was sought out. For those on the carnivorous diet, which I tried despite my better judgment, beware of the downstream consequences. Having that said, we also didn't evolve to consume and store such high quantities of vitamin A, so two wrongs may be necessary to make a right here, at least while we're ridding our bodies of this toxin. It's a matter of experimentation. During the initial months of the program, I felt more ill not eating meat, so I ate it every day. Many months later, I didn't perceive a difference, so I implemented the change. It all depends on where you are in your detox journey. Soluble fiber. For approximately 11 months of the program, my soluble fiber consisted of beans and sun fiber. After I started the detox, I wasn't able to fall asleep without taking a few sips of sun fiber, so I used it right before going to sleep as well as two times a day in between meals. Recently, however, after talk of psyllium husk started appearing in the chats, I experimented with it, psyllium husk powder specifically. The day after I used it, my cognition lit up Thinking was very clear. I had plenty of energy, very positive, and I slept much better. The day after that, much of these improvements returned to baseline, but now, about a month in on psyllium husk, I can say I've seen big gains, specifically improved sleep, and more frequent and vivid dreams. It's worth experimenting with. I currently drink small quantities, one-third of a teaspoon, first upon waking up, then in between meals, and lastly, an hour between before going to sleep for a total of four times a day. Mistakes. First, the standard, consuming too much soluble fiber when starting off. There were days when the detox was really rough just because I was eating more beans than I could tolerate. If you're in your early days of the detox and feeling unwell, this might be why. Second, a food I've been eating regularly throughout the year, I'd been eating regularly throughout this year that I've excluded from the above list is brown rice. Yes, I poisoned myself with arsenic and added another strain on my system. After you get a bout of tachycardia, it's a fast heartbeat. Abnormal digestive symptoms, a return of cognitive impairments, and mees lines on your nails, you don't need a blood test to know. I stopped the brown rice and saw myself return to baseline starting the next day. Don't do this to yourself. Eat it rarely as a precaution. Third, these are really failed experiments, but I'll leave them in here. I've tried diversifying my diet many times, but it seems that my toxicity levels are too high to allow for any other foods. Root vegetables like celery root, parsnips, burdock root, all produced one unwelcome reaction or another. Same with cooking oils, even refined avocado oil. Most recently, in hopes of getting more nutrition, B vitamins in particular, I experimented with the same pretzel rolls I usually eat, just whole grain. Goodness, did I get my ass kicked. <laughs> I won't go into the details except for one because it's so unbelievable. I woke up in the middle of the night with a chunk of my tongue burned off. And I'm talking about an actual chunk, not just the superficial lining. I've attached a photo as proof. He did. Otherwise, you'd call me crazy. There was a post some weeks ago about someone who had a hole in their sock, suspecting it was burned out by vitamin A. Well, strange things are happening, that's for sure. Thoughts. Ridding our bodies of vitamin A safely and efficiently is our goal. A silent co-traveler of this goal that I think we should be also be mindful of is healing. 
This may seem self-evident, and to a large extent, this process is already taking place without our intervention, but I've noticed that any missteps in my diet is when I eat a tongue-eating whole wheat pretzel roll, for example, produces very similar reactions every time. A crawling sensation in my left calf, pressure in my brain's right hemisphere, cognitive issues, probably related, GI issues, and a dry right hand. Others here likely have their own version of this. The point is, if your toxicity levels have been very high for very long, it suggests that the damage is localized and severe, almost if vitamin, as if vitamin A had carved out tunnels in specific parts of the body. This in itself deserves attention, and so as part of my larger journey, I plan on doing a 10-day water fast at least. In people whose bodies have been decimated by this poison, fasting may be an appropriate, maybe even necessary intervention in order to heal deeply, especially those areas that are otherwise in regular use, like the gut. I also suspect that this should be timed wisely, given that the longer fasts are taxing. A body still burdened with high levels of vitamin A may be overstressed when put into such an extreme state, so it would be a consideration for the tail end of the detox. I have to stick to this diet for longer. I'd wager another year or two, but I'll report on my fasting experience when the time comes. Which brings me to my last topic. The vitamin A discovery obviously changes everything with respect to the question, what do we eat? For us, it's what do we eat when this is all over? There are some people in this group who will be nearing the end of their detox. I'm not so sure. At some point they will. Some may choose not to stray too far from what they've been eating on this protocol, while others may want to venture out. I, for one, have my reservations about eating grains in the long term, for example, despite them, the refined them, being the only carbs I tolerate other than potatoes. Modernity has mistaken an adaptive event that merely conferred su survivability onto some of our ancestors for a natural diet. What helps you survive may not help you thrive. Root vegetables, on the other hand, appear to be a more likely candidate for a staple carb food. After all, we have to question our innate hankering for carb-based foods in general. They're not arbitrary. Why is the pull so strong? Was it an incentive to seek them out when finding them was hard to do? Like when they were in the ground? Maybe. I'm speculating, and I'm going to go. I'm going off on a tangent just to make the point that now, with the correct basic reasoning and empiricism, like our knowledge of vitamin A toxicity, we're in a much better position to answer the larger question. It's sub questions like, "quote What carbs do we eat?" We'll have to answer them sooner or later, and it's best to be prepared for when the time comes. I'd lastly like to use this post to sincerely thank Grant Jenneru and Garrett Smith for their life-changing work. We're lucky to reap the fruits of their labor. To everyone else, I wish you a safe and speedy recovery. Best of luck. End of testimonial. So, that was a person who was doing this all on their own. They're very observant. Me commenting on it, there may be some nutrients that they're missing. I have big hunches on that as to, as to why some of their progress may not have gone past a certain point. And we, my saying is, we test we don't guess, then we address. And that's that's what I would do in this situation. But this person is doing very, very well on their own. They are being observant of their reactions to things. They are changing course as they need to. Stop. People who are doing the vitamin A detox watching me, stop eating brown rice. And for those of you who are eating white rice, if you have to, because it's the only carb you tolerate, go ahead and do that. But just know there is arsenic in all rice out there. All of it. I see it on hair tests all the time. I can tell how much rice you eat based on a hair test. Don't eat American rice. It's all full of arsenic. I probably wouldn't eat Chinese rice either. Find other places. Find your rice from other places. But still, rice, people talk about the tea plant sucking up fluoride from the ground. It's just good at that. Well, rice is great at sucking up arsenic from the ground, wherever it's grown. So if there's what they do in the U.S. is they, they used to have cotton fields and they sprayed those cotton fields with arsenic compounds and those arsenic compounds went into the soil. And then we started growing later rice on those old cotton fields. And this is why all the American rice is so toxic in arsenic. I've had clients who have done testing on their own and said that the American white rice actually raised their arsenic levels more than the American brown rice did. Which shouldn't happen. But it does. Um, just like all the fish and shellfish you eat these days, I don't care where you get it from, it has mercury in it. 
I don't care where you get it from. I can tell on a hair test. If you're eating rice, you're getting more arsenic than you need, than you want. So anyway, that was just one observation in here. The 10 day fasting thing, he'll do that on his own. He'll let us know how it goes. Um, I have my hunches on that and uh, I'll, I'll get to some of that in the vitamin A detox program. Um, but anyway, hope you all enjoyed this. For those of you who are out there already kind of doing your version of the vitamin A detox program, hope you all benefit from this. If you're doing something like kind of like Grant Jenneru's thing, hope you get some benefit out of this. For those of you who are considering it, this is one person's approach. This person obviously had lots of health issues when they start, which usually means at the start, they're going to have to be much more restrictive because they're reactive to more things. And as we detox, not only is it a poison on the way in causing problems, but it's a poison on the way out, which can then cause problems on its way out. So we just have to monitor and change course and assess. And then, you know, the whole stop a thing, stop, think, observe, plan, act. Stop a S T O P A stop, think, observe, plan, act. We have to do that in our daily lives, or we should do it in our daily lives. And you need to do it in your nutritional and health life too. If you are following something from somebody else, maybe you're taking a lot of vitamin A, or maybe you're thinking that copper is the next wonderful thing. Or maybe you think you have iron overload without ever testing your blood. Um, and you're doing these things and maybe you feel better at the start, but a month or two later, or even a week, or maybe three months later, you start feeling much worse and you're only getting worse. And then, and then the people who you're consulting with tell you to just do more of the things that you've been doing that have now led you to feel worse. I'm going to tell you that after you start feeling worse long enough, maybe you should stop doing exactly what they're telling you to do and do the opposite. The definition of insanity. Doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. So if anybody is, is leading you on as you slowly get worse and worse, and worse, and they're telling you to do more and more of the things that are getting you worse and worse and worse. Remember the definition of insanity. It's not going to change all of a sudden. You need to stop what you're doing and do something different. I'll end on that. Hope you all enjoyed this. I will see you later. Bye.